the station that leaves no listener behind. You're listening to an encore presentation of this program, KCAA, the Inland Talk Express. Welcome to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Each week on this program, Jeff and his guests share their expertise, personal anecdotes, and the latest industry news to keep you in the loop. Now to provide you with insight and help you navigate the consistently changing world of real estate lending, here is your host for The Mortgage Voice, Jeff Barton. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for listening to the show, for coming to us each and every week as we try to give you some information about mortgages, about real estate, about the state of the economy, about how you're feeling. Uh, is this the right time? Is this the wrong time? All of these things are what's wrapped up in the show each and every week. And those that come and listen, I still, I actually got over, I forget there was, there was a number that Google sent me and said, congratulations, you're, your radio program now does X, and I forget what the number is. But whatever it is, I appreciate the support out there. Obviously, I'm here to try to support you in your decision-making process. But at the same time, having people listen and stay with it and uh, come back week after week, that's always uh, a good thing for me because it makes me feel better and it makes me think that uh, maybe the service that we're providing is a good one and that people like it, and if I stick with it, we'll get more people. And that's always the ego play in this for me. And I appreciate, again, you all listening to me. If you want to see the show each and every week, go to YouTube. Jeff Barton, The Mortgage Voice is on YouTube. Hundreds of shows there uh, dating back several years. Uh, the show's been on the air for uh, 10 years. KCAA is our uh, terrestrial radio station, AM, FM, in the IE. And going out to 10, the 15, anywhere out in the uh, San Bernardino and Riverside County areas, that's the place to go and hear the show on a weekly. And, of course, go to YouTube, Jeff Barton, The Mortgage Voice. That's where you can see the archive shows as well as click on there, say you like it, join up, and uh, make sure that uh, we know who you are and uh, can include you in what we do each and every week, and we appreciate it. Okay, let's get right to you news to use kind of information that I know everybody likes. Uh, we have a an average of what the mortgage interest rates are on a weekly basis, and we bring that to you. The 30-year fixed rate loan is 6.91 percent, 15 years is 6.47, the FHA is at 6.39, and the jumbo is at 7.30. The two-year is at 4.57 percent. Uh, that's the return you get on the two-year bond, and the 10-year bond is at 4.91. The spread is still about 40 to 50 basis points, has been that way for about four or five months. Uh, as we have said in past shows, the actual spread, which used to be the uh, bellwether, the um, the for forecaster, the um, all those things, what I'm trying to say is uh, it doesn't hold water anymore. The two-year and the 10-year, the spread, whether one is inverted or whether the other one isn't, really doesn't mean anything. We've gone quite a long time, over a year, maybe even longer, year and a half, where the two-year is really the yield is much higher than the 10-year, and yet... Here we are. We're still not in a recession. We're still not. Um, uh, we're still not really uh, in economic peril, as that particular uh, milestone or whatever you want to call that two-year inversion used to indicate. So, uh, what does this mean then? What does this mean for bonds? What does this mean? How you're supposed to look at what's happening in the mortgage interest rate, um, you know, uh, marketplace, and say, is this the best time? Will rates fall? That's always the question. Every borrower, I don't care who it is, first thing that comes out of their mouth when they talk about, you know, purchasing or refinancing is what's the rate? What's the rate? A lot of people who do look for rate are, are are always chasing the number. And what I mean by that is that if it gets to X, I will buy. If it gets to X, I will refi. And whatever that number is in their head uh, never seems to quite get there. And a quick story, Bitcoin. Now, um, during the pandemic, Bitcoin, as well as all these cryptocurrencies, and I've always said that they're you know, whatever it is that you're thinking about in terms of your investment strategies, Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies are dangerous. Uh, I'm not the only one saying that, obviously. There's a lot of old conservative guys like me, but also pretty smart guys in the investment world who don't touch it, don't go near it. However, I did say at one point, if Bitcoin got down to $10,000, uh, I would purchase. Well, of course, it went down to about 15000 and I didn't. 
And yeah, I know. You're all out there going, yeah, you idiot. You should have bought then. You're right. It's What is it, 57000 60000 whatever it is, we're looking like that particular marketplace and, and where that investment uh, opportunity came and went. <laughs> a lot like real estate. And that's the point of this is real estate is always a good investment if you know what you're looking for and how to get in and how to get out. If you're looking to build a family and stay there for 25, 30 years, what does it matter what you're paying? If you can afford the monthly, then get into it. Because I guarantee you, in that amount of time, you're going to have an ability to either refinance to lower your interest rate or refinance to take your uh, equity out or just leave it in there as your legacy or your inheritance to your children or grandchildren. Because real estate, especially in Southern California, I have some statistics here that talk about real estate prices and what's a good market, what's a bad market, and, and how much do you have to have in order to be comfortable in certain markets. But for me, when I purchased my own home, and it was back in 1995, okay? I had been a renter for many years in different cities around the country, finally settled started having some kids and we went to house shop in 1995 found a place in a, in a town that was uh you know fairly reasonable but this particular property had a uh, history of you know bad debt and uh, i think we bought it on a second trustee foreclosure yes those deals do exist far free uh, you know far between but at that time we were just coming out of a recession which was in 91 92 and real estate had yet to rebound. It wasn't like it is today, whereby we came roaring out of the 2008, 2009 downturn. And by 2012 through 2024, which is where we are now, we've seen real estate prices and the value of what you own really, you know, uh, double in price, if not more so. And certainly in the, since the pandemic, it's gone up 40%, 30 to five to 40%. And that is aside from inflation, on other products. Now, we don't call when your house value goes up inflation, but it is what it is. Regardless, uh, back in the day when we were purchasing our own house, you could have bought in our town for $250,000. Well, those same ranch style $250,000 houses now in our community are worth two and a half million. Now, this is obviously some 30 years later, but my point is when you are in the market to purchase a house, when you're in the market to refinance, when you're in the market to be a player in the real estate world. If your strategy is to live there, you can't go wrong buying at any price, almost. And the reason I say that is the story I just gave. I mean, if we're talking, you're gonna be there, raise your kids, and 25, 30 years later, after they're all up and gone, you're gonna be sitting on a pretty good amount of equity, or if you've used your uh, house and the value in your house over the years as an as an equity player, uh, then you've probably taken some money out, put kids through college. I mean, the return on owning is is forever, and it continues to build uh, regardless of what your situation is. Whether you're refinancing to a lower interest rate after you purchase, and that's always a strategy. Or, as I said, you take advantage of building wealth in your equity. These are things to understand about real estate, real estate purchases. My own particular story, the story about what happened in 2008 and where we are today, all of this says, hey, get in and, and play. And now we've seen real estate, uh, real estate um, inventories rise, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, inventories rise all over Southern California. Now, not to the tune of where they were in 2019, no, but better than they were last year. And obviously we've seen by these interest rates that we've gone down below 7% again in terms of the interest rate. And I think you can buy, you can get into a 15 year, even an FHA loan, it's still pretty reasonable. If you're in the mid sixes, that's pretty reasonable since uh, for, the, for the major part of COVID, uh, we, had, we had obviously a year, year and a half where it was below 4%. But for a lar large part, it was, you know, four and a half to five and a half percent. So we're not too far off of where historically uh, good rates would be said, hey, if you're in the fives, low sixes, these are pretty good rates. And I think that is true. And I think it is also true uh, that this particular summer we're going to see prices rise. I'll, I'll talk about that in a future, in a, uh, a little bit of segment, a little bit later on. Prices have risen and they continue to rise. And the main reason of that is, of course, 
there's not enough houses to buy, and the uh, demand is still uh, pretty strong. Anyway, I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. I really appreciate you listening to the show. We'll be right back. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. We'll be right back with more in just a moment. For questions or comments, send emails to info at malibufunding.net. Now, back to The Mortgage Voice with your host, Jeff Barton. Welcome back, everybody. I am Jeff Barton, and this is The Mortgage Voice. You are at KCAA if you are listening to us on the radio. Inland Empire, San Bernardino, Riverside counties. Hello, once again, we are here on the weekend, and we're talking about mortgages, and we're talking about real estate. We're talking about availability of funds, talking about are there properties really you want to buy that are available in a price range you can afford. All these things are, yes, things that uh, we do every spring. We talk about the spring buying season. This year is a little bit different just because uh, we're way past COVID, right? Nobody even talks about it anymore. However, what we had, what we do have as a result of that is uh, still a low inventory, and the inventory has not been really kind to us, even though it's a little bit better than it was last year. As I said in an earlier segment, it really isn't all that great. And uh, so if you're out there and you're you're looking for properties, hey, if you find something you're reasonably happy with i would i would start you know the process of trying to put in an offer if you're thinking in that direction the reason is is that in the summer it's going to get hotter people are going to want houses more the demand is going to go up and the housing inventory is going to go down and so you're going to be involved in multiples and nobody likes multiples nobody likes them at all okay let's talk a little bit about this real estate agent commission settlement agreement that came down from uh the Justice Department, I believe, uh, and the National Association of Realtors. Uh, there was a class action lawsuit brought against uh, several companies back in 2020, 2021. Uh, the companies they were brought against, as well as NAR, NAR and those companies lost. They ended up paying huge settlement. They lost again, they lost again. So at that point, NAR and a bunch of other companies decided to settle and they settled with uh, the plaintiffs uh, and the Justice Department signing off on the settlement we're still waiting for that and really it's about 148 million or 400 no it isn't 148 that's a different number it's 481 million uh, dollars over a four-year period that they have to pay off okay that's the settlement what's in the settlement is a, a question mark uh, there is a a real need for representation of buyers. If you're a buyer out there, you may or may not think that real estate agents are worth what they're being paid. Now, uh, that, that's not the question what I'm asking. What I'm asking is, do you think that representation is needed by you or by you know whoever it is that you're trying to help figure out um, how to buy real estate? Uh, real estate in California is litigious, and it's litigious for a lot of different reasons. Most of it is about discovery, disclosure, and uh, the openness and the protection that you have with your agent in terms of the process itself. Now, that's a lot of mumbo jumbo. What I really mean is you need somebody to help you through this. You wouldn't get a divorce without a divorce attorney. You wouldn't um, uh, go to probate without a probate attorney. Uh, you wouldn't go to your doctor's office, get advice, and not follow it. It's just professionals in the industries that they represent are good because they know what they're doing, and mainly because of precedent in, in other deals that have gone forward. And in the real estate world, what does that mean? It really means that the experience by which the person who tries to help you is worth it. It's worth something, right? So the lawsuit is about not mandating what that particular person as a buyer's agent makes. It's not saying, hey, you're the seller, you're the seller's agent, the seller's going to give you 5 6%, and you as the, seller, the listing agent, you're going to split that with the buyer's agent. That's out the window. You can't even say it. It's on, uh, off all the MLSs, so it won't even appear anywhere. And that particular payment of your buying agent, your agent, if you're the buyer, you've got to work that out with them, right? How is that going to work? So... As that gets worked through the system, what happens to the transactions that are happening today 
what happens to the transactions this summer, and how is this going to screw up the procedure by which you as the buyer are looking at to buy a house. Now, in certain markets, it's not going to matter. But in this market, it really does matter. Why? I just said it. There's no inventory. You're going to get into multiple offer situations. And what's the number one thing that any seller wants above and beyond all other thoughts, right? What is it? Of course, they want more money. Who doesn't? You know, I mean, it's, it's just the way it is. We talk about inflation in all aspects of life and how it's terrible, but we never talk about it in the real estate world. We just say, hey, you take advantage of that particular inflation or your house value went up and uh, you want to keep as much as possible. So the seller is not going to be hunky-dory about splitting commissions or giving money away that they don't have to. And this lawsuit says they don't have to. So the negotiation between the listing agent and the seller is going to go something like this. Hi, uh, seller person. I'm, uh, I'm Jeff. I'm your real estate prospective broker. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty good at what I do. And I think that I'm worth at least 3%. However, if I represent the buyer, that means I'm going to be doing two jobs. So I'm going to cut your deal. I'll do it for 4%. And that's how it's going to go. And the seller's going to decide whether they're going to work with you or somebody else that's going to do it for 2.5% for both people, right? But for most reasonable people, the 4% threshold for representing more than one person in a deal is really going to be how it's going to go. And so if then a buyer's agent has a client that they've got now and part of the settlement is that you have to have a buyer representation contract, right? It's no more handshake and a hug. Yeah, I'll represent you. No, you got to have it in writing, which means that the compensation, the, the way this agent is going to be paid by the buyer has to be worked out. So I came up with a strategy the other day. I uh, texted it out in some small capacity to see if there was any pushback, and there really wasn't. Because most people are trying to figure this out. And unfortunately, for you as the buyer or you as the seller, you're in the middle of it now. It used to be, you know, it was just the uh, seller who had to pay. They would cough up because tradition, the MLS and NAR, that's why they get sued, colluded to be able to say, hey, this is how it's done. And that was why they lost the lawsuit, because it was in a lot of the literature, according to the courts, that uh, demonstrated that there was this, you know, group that got together and set real estate prices uh, and, and you couldn't negotiate it. And that was what was proven in the court case and what the settlement is all about, which is why they're getting rid of all that and making you as the buyer's agent and you as the buyer come up with your own deal on the side. So here's what I think you should do. If you're the buyer and you know that you have to come up with money or be represented by the seller's agent, you know they're going to be paying that seller's agent probably 4%. So as the listing agent and the buyer's agent, as the buyer's agent in the contract to purchase for sale, you would say that that 4% that's going to be given to the, the uh, seller if they represent the buyer, say, no, I want 1% of that. So the, so the seller itself is not going to be paying any more money. They're just going to be paying that 4% they would be paying anyway. But 1% would go towards you as the agent for um, the buyer. The buyer at that point will be like, great, I'm off the hook. However, that's not reasonable either. The buyer's going to have to kick in something. Now, what they've said is you can ask the seller for a credit, a credit towards closing costs, which means that the actual commission has to be in the contract so it becomes a part of closing costs. So you say, okay, this is how we're going to do it. I'm going to get the 1% from the, sell the listing agent, right? Because they're going to pay 4% anyway if the listing agent represents both sides. So 1% goes to the buyer's agent, and the buyer in the contract says, I want a 1 to a 1.5% credit on closing costs from the seller. And there it becomes enough money to pay for some closing costs and at least get your buyer's agent 
2 percent. And I think that's reasonable. That's a reasonable compromise. Everybody's involved. And that's the mechanics on how to do it. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. And I am the answer grape. So give me a call. And thank you very much for tuning in. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. We'll be right back with more in just a moment. For questions or comments, send emails to info at malibufunding.net. Now, back to The Mortgage Voice with your host, Jeff Barton. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for tuning into the show, listening to us each and every week as we try to bring to you some answers to all those nagging questions about when you want to do this, if you want to do this, is there a right property? Uh, I spent a couple of segments this show just describing what my opinion is, and I always think that there's many different ways by which you can get financing for a property and then uh, uh, try to readjust later when rates do what they do and they always go up and they always come down. It's just a matter of timing. Uh, certainly equity in your home is a good thing to get and it continues to grow as we spoke about earlier. We see a 6% rise in um, real estate prices from a year ago. Anyway, we'll get to that a little bit later. But we bring to the show most times the best and the most expert people. So uh, th today is no exception. Jennifer Martinez from Sierra Pacific Wholesale joins us. We haven't had her on the show before, and I want to welcome her. Hi, Jennifer. How are you? Hi there. I am good. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. You know, we often get people who come on the show and get a little bit nervous about uh, just speaking to the general public about what's going on, but you have such an extensive background in the business. Why don't you just tell people about a little bit about yourself and maybe uh, uh, get into some products that you have over at Sierra Pacific. I would love that. Great. Thank you. So um, I am a 23-year veteran in this crazy industry. I have seen the ups and downs, yep. um, went through the financial meltdown. Yep. Um, for a lot of those years, I was actually a mortgage processor. Okay. Oh, so that I processed. Go on. I'm sorry. sorry. I interrupted you. Sorry. That's okay. So I processed for about 15, 16 years. Wow. And then decided to go and train loan officers on how to structure their loans. So I was a trainer for a couple of years and then became an account executive. So basically, I now do a processing job as well as a training job. <laughs> You do as an account executive now. No, for those of people who are out in the um, who are listening to the show, the account executive actually holds the hand of a lot of loan officers, especially inexperienced ones, even experienced ones, because they know how to structure deals, put deals together, get them funded. That's really the uh, heart of the AE's job. Uh, how's it going? Uh, well, it's <laughs> a hustle and a grind. Yeah. I mean, you know the the deals that are out here um you know some are difficult yep and um but you know i'm a huge advocate for my loan officers i have an amazing operations staff that supports me great and so we are able to you know make the loan officer look good um <laughs> in front of their referral partners no that's excellent okay tell uh, let's dig into it a little bit programs what, what do you do at sierra let people know um some of the highlights of the programs you're doing are you are you doing the dscrs are you doing non-qm are you, are you basically an fha shop what are you what are you mostly doing over there and uh yeah so so we're an agency lender okay um you know we are probably the or one of the um biggest ppo dpa lenders Okay. Um, we work very closely with the California Housing Authority. Okay. In closing, um, you know, just helping first-time homebuyers get into their home with down payment assistance. So it's a huge opportunity. Obviously, you know, people are sick of sitting on the sidelines waiting for yep. the market to crash or, you know, they're just jumping in. And so, um, you know, I, I wear my tiara and my crown very well um, <laughs> regarding <laughs> the <laughs> regarding the Calhafa program um, sure. as well as we do VA loans FHA loans um, manual underwrites on those and USDA um, for my VAs we offer a hundred percent cash out for refinances okay um, 
split entitlement as well as joint loans. What's that? You're huge in manufacturing. I'm sorry? What's that? A joint loan? Yeah. So a joint loan is actually when a veteran and a non-veteran decide to purchase a house together. Okay. And how does that work? Do they and use so, both scores? I mean, do I mean obviously, they usually use the lower score of the two, but um, what's the advantage of doing that? Well, so when you're dealing with, um, you know, it, the VA rate is actually a lot lower than a conventional uh-huh. um, rate. And so, you, you know, you're you're using the veteran's entitlement. So right. basically the veteran doesn't have to come in with any money down, but the non-veteran would have to come in with a um, with a down payment based on the purchase price or the appraised value, whichever is less. Does the non-veteran also go on title? They do. Oh, this is... So it's just like mm-hmm. doing a, a regular joint loan. Right. You know, a, right. a, a regular loan, ex- except you get the VA benefits because one of the parties is a, v- a veteran. Correct. That, that's pretty good. Susan, has this loan been around a long time? I don't know. I've been around a long time. It anyway. has. Okay. There's not a lot of lenders that offer it. Okay. Just because, um, you know, you do have to send the loan over to the VA to get final sign-off. Okay. But, um, you know, it's a huge, I, I think it, as a veteran, you should use, um, you know, that everything that's, your, that's offered. Sure. Absolutely. Please. No, this just allows other people to get involved with that type of loan. I know that um, either the down payment or maybe the credit score is at issue for some veterans. So, you know, I know it's 100% financing, but not the closing costs, right? VA still has to come in well, with the or the seller. So it's 100% for the veteran. Right. The oh. non-veteran will have to bring in a down payment. Okay. So, oh, okay. Well, what's the percentage of that down payment, or is it... Um, you know, it's fifteen percent of the purchase price or the appraised value, whichever is less. Okay. You no, know, this is a pretty good loan. No, I've not heard about it, and like I said, I've been around in you know, a long time. So I was like, wow, this is an interesting product. No one's ever really talked about it. So if you're out there and you're listening, and you're a veteran, and you have a spouse, a friend, uh, you know, does it have to be family member? Or it can be anybody. Um, it could be anybody. So you okay. just have to have a relationship with them. So. Okay. Like, I have one right now where um, the son, who's a veteran, is purchasing with his father. I see. Okay. You know, that's uh, great. Uh, well, this just sounds like a great program. Uh, and, and uh, okay, you also mentioned some DPA programs, Cal Hafa, of course. Um, now, there was, there was a program out, and I don't know if the money has come and gone already, which talked about uh, gifting uh, after a certain amount of time and not having repayment on a certain DPA program. Um, so that is no longer available. The program that <laughs> that's is what not I thought. heavy right now right. is the Dream for All. Okay. So basically the state of California gave uh, the California Housing Authority um, a certain amount of money right. to be able to offer this program. So um, the last go around, it was done in seven days. Right. So now that it's come back around, there are stricter um, guidelines for people to qualify the, for this program. And what it is, it's a 20% second loan. Okay. And it's a shared equity. So there's right. you have to share equity with the state of California when you go to um, either refinance or pay off the loan. But it's a it's a limited share equity, right? It's not the hundred percent, right? Okay. No, correct. So you, um, what it is is, it's twenty percent or one hundred and fifty thousand, whichever is less. Okay. Um, and whatever that one hundred and fifty thousand percentage comes out to, is the percentage of equity that you need to share in. Um, with the state of California. And is that share of 50-50 split, or is it based on the 80-20? What is that? What is the share? Well, so it's whatever percentage of the appraised value of the... Right. Um, so they have to pay back. So let's say they they received the um, 150000 Right. You know, and then that was a 12% 
loan to value. Right. So they would have to share in 12% of the appreciated value of when they go to refinance or pay off the loan. Okay. It still seems like a reasonable deal to me. I mean, I, I, I thought uh, when, last year when it came out and, and we started promoting it on the radio here, and it was gone and so quickly. Uh, so this year when it came out, like what, what you're talking about is uh, part of the deal. It's interesting. I think that's uh, – shared equity is a little dangerous to me. I don't know. It harkens back to days in the past where that was uh, much more of a prevalent thing, and we're talking probably the 80s or the 90s. Um, anyway, I appreciate the information. Uh, Excellent. Absolutely. And, yes, I mean, so there is a cap on the, the shared equity piece of it, which is good for, yep. you know, the home, the home buyers. Um, and it helps them get into a bigger home than, you know, right. than they would normally qualify for. Um, but it's going to be a true lottery. So the lottery opens on April 3rd. Okay. And it's going to um, stay open until the 29th of April. Let and then they are going... Let people know how to get in touch with you in case they need somebody to talk to about this. Uh, deadline's coming up, and obviously somebody to be able to help them with this would be a good idea. I, I mean, I have several loan officers. I know that there are people promoting it. Okay. Um, you know, on Instagram and Facebook, but, you know, you can always refer to my email address. Um and I can put them in contact with a loan officer? Sure, however you want to do it. It's fine with me. Okay. I was just giving you the okay. opportunity to try to get in touch, have people get in touch with you if you'd like. Or even for, you know, brokers that have not signed up with Sierra Pacific, I could, you know, I'll, I'll give them my information and then, you know, we can get them signed up as well so that they can have the opportunity to, to promote this program. And you can email me. At You're listening Jennifer to The Mortgage K Voice and with and Jeff Barton. We'll be right back with more in just a moment. For questions or comments, send emails to info at malibuhunting.net. Now, back to The Mortgage Voice with your host, Jeff Barton. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. We've run out of time, unfortunately, but uh, we'll have you back. See, see how the program so goes. Yeah, you're quite welcome. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you very much for coming on the show. I appreciate you. Thank you. You're welcome. Jennifer Martinez from Sierra Pacific Wholesale. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry, and thank you very much for listening to the show. As we drift into our 10th year doing this on KCAA, the Inland Empire Strong, they're very good signal out there up on the hill. AMFM, both of those stations are doing quite well, and we're on Saturday and Sunday, and we roll in two different shows on the weekend. So if you're listening now and it's a Saturday, you can tune in on Sunday and listen to us, too, as we talk about what's going on in your neck of the woods as well as what's happening globally with the real estate prices as well as the mortgage interest rates. Everybody knows the mortgage interest rates have been somewhat steady in the last couple, three weeks. They're down. It's down a little bit. Uh, and we anticipate, obviously, at some point, if the rates by the Fed, which tangentially affect the mortgage interest rates, come down somewhat, we might see a little bit more relief in the mortgage rates, and uh, that will be great for you as the borrower, but bad for you as the borrower, because it's going to mean you're going to have more competition for that house, and there's very few of them on the market. So anybody who's out there right now in the real estate world, get into it. It's the best place to be. Uh, joining us uh, once again, our resident expert on all of these things is Connie Hernandez from PMA, and she joins us now from uh, West Covina, I believe. Yes? Connie? Hi. Yes. Hi, Jeff. Thank you for having me. We are here in West Covina ready to help. <laughs> Great. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. What's your take on it and how we're uh, going to uh, begin this particular summer season, which is just around the corner from the spring buying season? I don't know. Have you been busy uh, last couple, three months? You know, to be quite honest with you, Jeff, as you know, on the loan side, it's been a bit slow. Yep. What we're doing in our office is we're trying to market to uh, more of a I get not a commercial loan, but the DSCR loans that right. are available out there for 
uh, people that have, you know, five to 10 units. Um, that's a great product. It's not just for the refis, but also for potential buyers that want to potentially sell their four unit, maybe upscale to a six unit. But with that being said, on the real estate side, as you know, we do have a real estate division sure. and we have really busy. Uh, we do have multiple listings, but our listings are not on the market very long. Um, I right. can share with you the last two open houses that we had. We received seven offers just that one over that one weekend on one property. And this is out in Hesperia, by the way. Wow, that's a drive. It, 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 right. And right. Um, we have agents showing the Hesperia property all the way from Long Beach. Wow. So that is definitely a drive. Um, the property in Lake Elsinore, that, show, that showed really well and sold really quickly. Also, we had substantial amount of offers, so you are correct. The inventory out there is slim, so your advice is perfect. It's a, a good time to talk to potential sellers. You know, we need the inventory. I almost feel bad because we cross-qualify every single client that comes to submit an offer for our properties, Sure. and I get to speak to them. And, you know, these agents are very hopeful in getting their clients in, and surprisingly enough, on on my side, you know, there there are people out there that are okay with the seven and a quarter interest rate, and they're still on the FHA side. You know, we're somewhere around the six and a half, right? right? So, right. Um, you know, they're okay with those rates, and I think the main thing they want to do is they they want to they want to obtain a home. They still have. You know, those desires of being homeowners, and they're doing what it takes to get there. I've noticed that there's been um, more co-borrowers, you know, non-spouse co-borrowers on some of these deals. Um, credits are good. You know, you're, you're obviously to buy a $600,000 home, you're going to need a substantial amount of income now, right? Sure you are. And, mm -hmm. um, so it's just a matter of planning. You know, you have to... Be accessible to your realtors, take care of your realtors, and be resourceful with uh, how you're looking for those loans. Are, are sellers willing to look at these kind of offers? I mean, usually a seller is looking for the quickest and the fastest, and anything that smells of an FHA loan or co-borrowers or all this kind of stuff really turns them off. Is it is it like that, or is it uh, you know just a matter of how much money they're going to make? I mean, if obviously that property has uh, offers from those type of borrowers, uh, but the, the price is higher, maybe that's how you sell it. I don't know. You actually hit hit it right on the nail. Okay. Um, so what we're seeing is that we're still seeing a variety of different types of buyers. Like, for example, on the the new listing that, um, that Marcus um, has, had seven offers on it. We had an FHA borrower with three and a half percent down, um, strong income, low ratios, uh, also great FICOs. We had a conventional buyer with 5% down, also had strong reserves, great credit score. So I think people are really doing their homework or their agents are doing a great job or their loan officers, I should say, are doing a great job in training them on what they need to do to look as strong as possible for their offers. But then we also received people that have uh, either sold a property or have been able to save a substantial amount of money. So they have, you know, north of 200000 in the bank. Uh -huh. So that's when you start looking at, you know, we usually try to do a spreadsheet for the, um, the sellers so they can get a good idea of what they feel is best for them as far as which offer to go with. Because, like you said, some people do tend to shy away from the FHA loans sure. because, you know, appraisals tend to be a bit more conservative, um, may take a little bit longer to close that loan. Well, that's the and key, then, right? Yeah. It's the timing. Exactly. I mean, you know, if it's going to take me 30 days to get paid from you and 15 to get paid over here, you know, that really weighs, you know, money, quick, quicker money really is a better uh, deal for a lot of sellers. Right. So it's it's pretty much up to the agents to really show the pros and cons of each of their offers because mm -hmm. the sellers look to us as the professionals to give them the proper advice. Interesting. Now, remember back in the day when offers were presented? When was the last time you had an offer presented on a property <laughs> you represented? That'd be like 10 years ago, uh, maybe longer? 
Maybe longer. Yeah, Maybe exactly. Longer. <laughs> it was the most nerve-wracking thing. I'd go in there as the buyer's agent and sit in front of the seller, and, of course, you know, you always had to bring something, right? And maybe some some flowers, some cookies, something to, you know, sweeten up the... the man, it was very nerve-wracking. It was like auditions back in the day when I was an actor. My gosh, oh. you sit there and, you, you know, you're pitching and you just get stared at. <laughs> it was awful. But I did like it just because I felt like I had some control over the process. And, and in this world, it's all you know, emailed and... Um, DocuSign kind of contractual offers sent over, I believe. Different times. Yeah, very different. different yeah. <laughs> I, I think, uh, you know, it's just um, everything's about technology and how quickly you can get something done now. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, and, you know, we've become a bit more proficient, I think, in our careers where I see a lot more emails from the agents where they're very thorough as far as trying to sell their client over the email, right? And yeah, right. They'll send, uh, they'll send everything in a very orderly fashion. They have their proof of funds. They have their DU findings. They have all these things that they know they have to provide in order to have an opportunity to potentially acquire the property. You know, uh, you, you speak about it, and, and it's true. Uh, there's been so much change due to technology, but the the softer touch, i.e., the email about the client or the love letter, what we used to call when the buyers mm -hmm. would represent uh, uh, their, their uh, the buyer's agent would represent their client with this nice letter about them. But that's all sort of gone by the wayside, and it's all really cut and dry. How much? When can you get it done? And uh, I don't I don't know if that's well in this market because it's a seller's market once again. It, it probably right. doesn't matter, but uh, perhaps in the future it will when you have to try to have the seller do the opposite to do the kind of selling that they need to do in order to get the buyers to come up to the price or at least make a better offer. Well, you know, California is still a desirable market. I mean, people yep. move away and then sometimes they end up moving back. Uh, we still have, no matter what anyone says, people move here for the weather, right? Right, that's and, true. Um, if you want to live this lifestyle with this weather, you pay a price. So, unfortunately, you know, that's just how it is. But, I mean, I still see a lot of properties that are, you know, they're not sitting on the market. Unless, nope. honestly, the only ones that I see that are kind of sitting a bit longer are the properties that are like north of $2 million. But then again, you know, you have fewer buyers looking at that price point. That is absolutely the truth. And there's always that real sweet spot whereby it seems to be a very popular price. And above that, yeah, it takes time to buy and or sell it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, Connie, we've run out of time here. You want to let people know how they can get in touch with you? That'd be great. Absolutely. Thank you for asking. Sure. Connie Hernandez. You can reach me at 626-422-2017. You can find us in downtown Covina, corner of Badillo and Citrus, 101 North Citrus, Covina. Excellent. Connie, thanks very much for coming on. I always appreciate it. I want to have uh, Marcus on the um, on the show next week, so get him prepped up. Okay. Oh. He doesn't need prepping, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> this generation is so used to being on camera they because are. of the cell phone, yes. you know, so it's all um, good. Unlike, unlike my generation, right? <laughs> oh, my my generation, sheesh. I think television was the technology when I was born, so that, right? was, a, that was a big, <laughs> exactly. Anyway, thanks, Connie. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Jeff. Thank you, as always. That's Connie Hernandez from PMA. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. We'll be right back. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. We'll be right back with more in just a moment. For questions or comments, send emails to info at malibufunding.net. Now, back to The Mortgage Voice with your host, Jeff Barton. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for tuning in, listening to the show. You can watch us on YouTube, and we're also on a number of different podcasts. I think, Daryl, you have that for us? I sure do, Jeff. We've got Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, iHeartMedia, YouTube, podclips.io, and themortgagevoice.com. Okay, if you want to see me and hear me, YouTube or themortgagevoice.com, you can see and hear all the different podcasts. Uh, guests that we have on the show be able to contact them directly 
And podclips.io, great place to go for your podcasting needs. It's a centralized location for any number of terrific people who are on there. I know a friend of mine, Josh, does a, a nice health show that he had actually Marion Williamson on the other day. So if you're uh, liking a Marion Williamson and you're thinking about choosing her to pass your vote to, you should listen to that show. Anyway, podclips.io, it's a great place to go. Centralize all your podcasting needs. I'm Jeff Barton. This is The Mortgage Voice. And again, thank you for listening to the show. Okay, so th there's a couple of things I want to get to before the end of the show. Uh, well, as, as we always do, we go to uh, a number of uh, websites to look for information that is both entertaining as well as uh, informative. Um, uh, one of the websites that caught my attention this week uh, talked about real estate prices and uh, where they are going. And if you want to live in certain cities, what it's going to cost you to live there. Now, they have a, a criteria by which they, they, you know, bracket that in, and they call to live comfortably. Now, to them, comfortably is, and they did a 50-30-20. I'm reading it because I didn't know what it was until I read it. 50% of your expense or the money you make spent on housing, okay, which means that both your insurance as well as the mortgage payments. 30% is discretionary, which means you can spend it on whatever you want to spend it on. And 20% goes into savings or investments for the future. So it's the 50-30-20 and based on that criteria, that's comfortable living. Okay, so the top cities in California and where those California cities rank on the total list of U.S. cities. That's how I did it. Anyway, here we go. So at 19 is Los Angeles. And these are California cities on the list of how much money you need to make to be comfortable. L.A. was 19. Anaheim was 18. 17 was Long Beach. Now we'll get into the cities and the amount of money you need to live comfortably in those cities. I mentioned those other cities quickly just to show you that California really dominates this lift. Ten out of the top 20 cities are in California, okay? And that means the amount of money you have to make in order to live comfortably. Chula Vista, you have to make, and they're number 12 on the list, $289,000 in order to live comfortably at the 50, 30, 20 formula that we talked about at the top of the segment. And number 11 is San Diego, same number, 289,000. Santa Ana is at, tw at 9, at 20, 291,000. 8 is Irvine, 291,000, same number. And this one really kind of threw me. Oakland, California, in order to live comfortably. Now, I've been to Oakland, okay? Now, maybe Oakland has a bad rap, I don't know. But when I was there, we were up there for an event. Our truck was stolen, and the next day, the police were showing us videos of people surfing, surf riding down the street on the equipment that was stolen from our truck. So I was like, that's my impression of Oakland. But Oakland is number six on the list, and you need, in order to live comfortably in Oakland, $316,000. That's what you have to make each and every year. Uh, and number two on the list, is San Jose, San Jose, California, $334,000. And San Francisco, of course, number one on the list. To live comfortably in that city, you have to be making $339,123. So it shows you there's people making a lot of dough out there. There just is. Uh, inflation aside, these cities demand that you make salaries way in advance of what the median salary here is in the U.S. And I believe the median salary is still in the $30,000 range, which is telling you that middle class from 30 to 60 or $90,000, there's a heck of a lot of people in these places that live there. There's millions of people who live in these California cities. They're all making pretty darn good money. Now, granted, if like me, you bought 30 years ago, you bought in cheap, and now your property is worth a lot, and you're happy about it. I read an article today that talked about the prison that you're in because you can't tap into that equity. Now, that is a headline that makes you click on it, right? The reality is you can tap into that equity. You're just going to have to pay the going interest rate. Now, there's a lot of companies out there who will, who will do reasonable loans at, at uh, a seconds or HELOCs or roll it into a first, 
uh, by refinancing you out of that 3 and 4% mortgage, which nobody wants to do. However, as we get further away from the pandemic and we get less and less uh, comfortable with the amount of money that we, either we have in debt or that we want to, you know, take money and use, that amount of equity will become a temptation to a lot of people and we'll see the market slowly loosen up. We've seen a little of it this spring, but not necessarily enough to live in any of the cities I just mentioned. So let's get to a few more items on the list here before we close up shop. Uh, real estate prices, as I said earlier, is, uh, are up 6% year over year. In San Diego, which is the leader in the country, talked about this a couple weeks ago too, 11.2% up. Uh, Los Angeles, number two on the list, up 8.6%. And the lowest on the list of, pro of uh, cities that are actually seeing year-over-year -year price gains is Portland uh, at 0.9%. It's still, on an annual basis, not that bad. We're seeing equity being riven. But on a, a inflationary front, no, it's probably not the greatest. I mean, obviously, you're thinking, given all of the things that are raising in value and, and raising in cost, uh, that point. 9% is probably not going to cover it uh, when it comes to how you're going to figure in your long-term uh, wealth and your retirements and things like that. Okay, I wanted to talk a little about appraisals, uh, appraisals themselves and what they mean, how they are being calculated, and what you can do about it in the future going forward. There are a lot of banks out there, a lot of ways that the appraisal process is going to be changed. We talked some about credit score and how that's going to be changing over the next 18 months. Uh, we're going to a different uh, credit score, more about trending credit score rather than frozen uh, snapshot credit scores. We talked about that two or three weeks ago. You can go back into the archives on YouTube or at KCAA and look up that show. Uh, but in terms of what is an appraisal, how do we evaluate a house, how can we say, okay, this house is worth this. We usually go off comparable property values, but of course in a changing marketplace, those may not be as accurate as possible. So there are things like collateral risk, how collateral risk is evaluated, what banks look at for um, the true value, the true nature of their risk when they're lending you money. Because at the end of the day, it's all based on perception if I say that property's worth this and a buyer comes in and say it's worth that, guess what? The, the value of the property is that. It's not what I say it is because I'm the appraiser. So there's always some difference between the expected and the reality in appraisals in what we do. Usually on the conservative side, when we're looking at a, a market or a, an economic downturn, when we're looking at something like we have now, which we really haven't seen all that much, inventory is really down. We have a lot of people sitting on equity in their homes, trillions of dollars worth of equity in the home, and there's not a lot of movement. So how do we evaluate a property that's coming on the market when we're talking about what a seller wants, what the appraisal has to um, be able to go in and justify, and then what the bank will lend based on that appraiser? All these things are in flux. And so as we work our way through whatever market this is, and we're still trying to figure out if the seller quote unquote label on this particular market is accurate enough to really describe what's going on. Uh, you out there as a buyer, you know what's going on. Can't find a place that you want to buy, even though you do want to buy, even though the real estate uh, mortgage interest rates are high, you still want to get in there, you still want to be a player. So that's where it is. Okay, a couple other statistics, 86% of people who buy, buy with a real estate agent. Now that's before the lawsuit settlement. I wanna see where it is in the next six months. 89% of those people who use an agent would use that agent again and recommend that agent. That's probably as accurate as it's gonna be in another six months. And 51% of buyers found a home on the internet, find homes, their own home on an internet, and 29% find it through an agent. So the shifting marketplace about what's needed and how much that's worth is really something worth watching, and we'll stay on top of it as well. Anyway, I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry, and we'll see you next time. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. For more on today's topic, visit www.malibufunding.net. 
news, weather, and talk from KCAA, broadcasting to the Moreno Valley, Corona, and Riverside. Hi, I'm food critic Alan Morgan, and I'm excited to tell you about Ray 